So we are studying Masechet Sanhedrin, what is it, about two and a half weeks before Rosh Hashanah, um, Tavshin Pedaled, um, and um, we are on page Sadihe Amud Aleph, on the very bottom of the page, we are uh, studying the amazing sugya of Od Hayom Benov, that's appropriate for Rosh Hashanah because it shows us how our actions have consequences, and we were studying what these consequences were in the case of David HaMelech. Today, Od Hayom Benov. Yes. Right, we read it on Pesach, I believe. Um, it's a beautiful uh, story, the way the Gemara describes it is um, it really beautiful. But okay, today we're going to be doing another uh, episode. Um, what happened? So really, it's a continuation, but there's going to be a slight... Um, we're going to interject. So we started discussing last week the idea of uh, wormholes. Um, and how this uh, idea appears in the Gemara where the Kafsala Hema Ares, where the earth uh, jumps. No, it's not all that, no, it's not Rosh Mechila, it's, it's not, it's not Pesach that we read Od Hayom Benov, that was a mistake. Um, on Pesach we read, uh, of course, Yechezkel, Techayat Ametim. Okay, um, so the second line from the bottom, Tanul Abanan, so this is what we, we started telling this last week. Tanul Abanan, on the bottom of the page, second line from the bottom, right? Um, what's, no, 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 I see that we got a very nice crowd today. So I'm assuming that the football, uh, this Monday night football is on, but it's not a good game. What, what is it? No, the Jets aren't playing. The Jets aren't playing. Okay, all right, the Jets aren't playing. Good. Um, okay, so, Tanul um, Abbanam. Shelosha. Three people, there was this uh, jumping of the earth towards that individual, which we discussed. Like we started this last week, but I'm just going back so we have the context. Eliezer, Ayyad Abraham. The first one was Eliezer, the slave of Abraham Avinu, or the servant, more properly, of Abraham Avinu. He was sent on a mission to find a wife for Yishak. And Abraham Avinu said, I want you to go far away, go to the area of Padan Aram in uh, northern Syria. Very long distance, so that was the first person. Second person, the Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu, we'll see where. Kapsalo Ha'ares, we're going to explain that. And finally, Abishai ben Seruya in the story that we read last week. So Abishai ben Seruya Hade Amram. That we studied last week, we already explained. Kapsalo Ha'ares. Now we're going to do Eli Ezer and Yaakov. Let's start with Eli Ezer. Eli I'm sorry? One very good and interesting last week. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you. Eliezer and Abraham. So let's start with Eliezer, the, the servant of Abraham. Um, as you know, he has a long distance. What is the distance from, uh, let's say, the area of uh, central Israel, the Er Shaba, to northern Syria? I, I would think it's, a, it's, it's quite a walk. Uh, or even if you're going with camels, it's quite a ride. And the Pasuk says, the Avo Hayom El Ha'ain. I arrived on this very day by the well. So you remember he arrives as evening, the sun is about to set, and then the, the young ladies, they're going towards the well because they're gonna be collecting water for the houses so they have uh, water at night. So he arrives in the eye, he arrives in the well towards the evening. And it says, So this teaches us um, that on this very day, he left Eres Israel on this very day. He arrived to Padan Aram. So here we see the Zechut of Abraham Avinu because of the Zechut of Abraham Avinu that Eliezer was going uh, to find a wife for Yishak. He had Siata Dishmaya, God helped him, and somehow he arrived there and he was there on the same day. That's that's the Abu Hayyum al Ain. Yaakov Avinu. Uh, I think we have an extra book here. So you can take it from me. Yes. Yaakov Avinu. What about Yaakov Avinu? Dichtiv. The Pasuk says as follows. Vayese Yaakov mi Be'er Shaba. Vayele Haran. It says that Yaakov Avinu left Be'er Shaba. That's where he, where he lived. Because remember, Esau wanted to kill him. So just to give you this background, Yaakov Avinu gets a berachah from Yisak. Esau finds out. by Yisak, Seaka, Gedola, Omara. He screams. And then he says, Yikrebu yeme evel aviv ahargat Yaakov Avinu. When my father is gonna pass away, I'm gonna kill my brother Yaakov, right? That's his plan. 
So he wants to kill Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu finds out. Uh, Rivka more correctly finds out. And, and basically Yaakov runs away from Be'er Shava and he gets to Haran. Now, interesting, if you look at the Pasuk, it says, Ve'yesei Yaakov in Be'er Shava, Ve'yelech Haran. It says, he left Be'er Shava and he arrived in Haran. Haran is in uh, northern Syria. Uchtiv, and the very next Pasuk says, Ve'yifka Makom. He came upon the place, the place being, um, and let me tell you what happened, in the Torah, in the Humash specifically, because in the Nevi'im and in the Ketuvim, Yerushalayim is referred to by name. In the five books of Moses, the Humash doesn't refer to Yerushalayim by name because it still wasn't known as the Holy City. So it was referred to as the place, but Makom means the place that was known as holy, but it wasn't known yet as Jerusalem, and they didn't know that the Beit HaMikdash is going to be there. It's not until the days of David HaMelech that God reveals to King David that the Beit HaMikdash is going to be in Jerusalem, and he shows him exactly where it's going to be. The, the Malach takes uh, the Harbosh Shilufa Be'adol, right? And he points at the place where the uh, Beit HaMikdash is going to be. So Yaakov Avinu doesn't know that this is going to be the place of the Beit HaMikdash, but he understood that there was something holy there. Now it says, What's wrong with the Pasuk? Again, it says, He leaves Be'er Shava, and he arrives to Haran. The next Pasuk says, He arrives in the place, meaning in Jerusalem. What's wrong in the Pasuk? Obviously. If he arrived to Haran, how can he be arriving to Jerusalem after he arrived to Haran? If you're going, if you're at Be'er Shava, Be'er Shava is in southern Israel, you go, you go north, you hit Jerusalem. After you hit Jerusalem, you, I mean, many days after, you're going to eventually hit northern Syria, right? So what does it mean when it says, he left Be'er Shava, he arrived to Haran, and then and then afterwards he hits Jerusalem. You understand the question? There's something wrong with the order. It's like saying, I went for, from New York, I arrived in Florida. And then after I arrived in Florida, I arrived in New Jersey. Well, no, New Jersey is on the way to Florida. It's not after Florida. So here, Jerusalem is on the way to um, uh, Haran. It's not after Haran. Maybe on the way back. What? No, it's on the way back. Because the way back, it t- tells us a story. Meaning it tells us what happened. This story happened when he sees the... Um, Malachi Elohim, Olim Yoredimbo. He sees the ladder and he sees the angels. It's that night. So he's, he's leaving Eres Yisrael and he sleeps in Jerusalem on the mountain, on the holy mountain, mm-hmm. and he has that dream. Okay. The Pasuk says, And the Pasuk says he falls asleep there because the sun disappeared. So it was pitch black. And again, if you've ever been in a blackout, and you probably, I don't know if you ever had blackouts in Deal, right? At nighttime, mm-hmm. it's probably pitch black, I'm thinking, right? Because you have the thunderstorm. So, it happens uh, often. What? It happens a lot. It happens a lot. So pitch black, you can't see anything. You can't see anything. So he's there in the middle of the wilderness. He's scared. It's pitch black. He can't see anything. So he decides, let me go to sleep. He doesn't know that where he's sleeping is the mountain, Harabai, Har Sion, where his father was bound to the Mizbeach by his grandfather. Meaning the place he's sleeping is the place of Akedat Ishaq, right? He doesn't know that yet. Okay. So what happened? So first of all, let's figure out the order of things. So the Gemara says he's going to Haran, and he arrives to Haran. And then he realizes, How could I have done that? I just arrived to Haran. Now, what are you going to do? I just arrived to Haran. And that means, I just realized, as I was, because he was running away. So because he was running away, you know, when you're running away, you're like a little uh, panicky. And he just realized, I passed by that holy mountain where Abraham Avinu did Akidat Ishaq on my father, and I didn't stop? Meaning, how could, how could, how could I have done that? Right? There's um, um, the, um, whenever I go to a place, my father always, Allah Hashem, used to tell me, you have to visit the synagogue in the place. That's what he used to tell me. Like if I would go to like some island, even like uh, St. Thomas, there's a synagogue there, make sure to visit it. Why? Because it's like, it's, it's, um, it's disrespectful not to show the proper interest and the proper kavod, the proper respect towards the place of, a sheikh, of the Shekhinah. Now, this is much more. This is, this is actually Yerushalayim. It's Harabayit, right? So he feels very guilty that he didn't stop to pay homage to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
אפשר, כן, אפשר שעברתי על מקום שהתפללו בו אבותיי ואני לא התפללתי בו? How can this be? My fathers prayed in this place and I didn't pray there? ואלה מהדר, he said, I have to go back. He goes back. כיוון תהרהר בדעת אלה מהדר, קפסה להרעה מיד ויפקע במקום. Now, once he made a decision to go back, the wormhole that I spoke about last week, boom, a miracle happens. And he was in Yerushalayim on that very day. That's the Kefisat Bakom that we're talking about that happened to Yaakov Avinu. When he wanted to return to Yerushalayim, it would have been, let's say, three, four, five, six, seven days, whatever the distance is, I don't know. And he gets there immediately. But if Gamba Makom literally means he hit the place, meaning unexpectedly. Oh, wow, where am I? Right, that's why if Gamba Makom. Oh, so that's the opening to what you were saying, wormhole. <clears throat> yes, exactly. Exactly. Vayifka ba makom. That's why it says vayifka, right? Right. Okay. So that's one explanation of vayifka ba makom. There's going to be another explanation. Davar achir en pegiya el atefila. You know what pegiya means? To come upon pegiya um, tefila. That's prayer. I'll explain this in a moment. שנאמר, ואתה אל תתפלל בעד העם הזה, ואל תישא בעדם רינה ותפילה ואל תפגע בי. God tells Jeremiah, enough praying for the people, enough, um, you know, beseeching me that I have mercy on them, I've had it with them, they're doing Abu Dazara. So, אל תפגע בי, what does אל תפגע בי mean? Don't bother me, don't come upon me, says God to Yirmiya Hanavi. What does this mean? A very deep concept. I want you to understand this. What's the relationship between the two explanations? The first explanation of Ayyub Makom is what? That he was in Haran. He decided, I'm gonna to go towards Yerushalayim. I wanna be in that place. So there's a quantum jump, why? And for those of you who don't know, uh, um, in quantum mechanics, um, electrons, they don't go from you know, there's different shells around the nucleus, right? So the, the electron can be close to the nucleus. Shell number one it could be a little further. Shell number two could be a little further. Shell, shell number three, whatever the shells are. So when, when an electron goes from one shell to the next shell, it doesn't go there. It kind of like disappears and then reappears. Right? It's one of the mysteries of quantum mechanics, right? So that's called the quantum jump. So. I'm just saying this so you understand that the Chachamim, this seems very fanciful, but in science we have this, right? Where suddenly an object is, is, is in one place, the electron, and boom, it just disappears and it reappears in another place. No explanation for how that is. I mean, they have mathematical descriptions of what happened, but nobody really understands how could that be. So that's what happened to Yaakov Avinu. So the first explanation by Yifka Makom, he was in Haran, suddenly boom, Kefisat Derech, he's in Yerushalayim. Okay, that's one explanation. The second explanation is what? That it's talking about Tefillah. What's the relationship? You understand my question? What's the relationship between these two explanations? Let's, let's hear some opinions. I want to get some, uh, some assistance here. Baruch Atah Adonai. Shalom. Okay. Tefillah is not time, it's not time Restricted by time, it has some kind of element that's similar. You know what tefillah is? Tefillah, proper tefillah. Proper tefillah is a quantum jump. The tzaddikim, like Yaakov Avinu, when they used to pray, we should do that also. We should. I don't know if we if we do, but we should. It's a quantum jump. Suddenly, he's in the presence of God. How on earth? What, what's, what's, what's further? Let me put it to you this way. The distance between Yerushalayim and Haran. I'm telling you, there was a quantum jump. He was there in Haran, and boom, he comes to Jerusalem. And you say, oh, that's kind of fanciful. I don't know if that, how could that be. Okay, it happens in electrons. Okay, so maybe scientifically, but I still don't quite get it. You know what a bigger quantum jump is? From Haran, which is outside Israel, to Yerushalayim, which is the holiest place. You know what a bigger quantum jump is? That we, human beings, stand in the presence of our Creator, and suddenly we can feel His presence in the middle of the Tefillah. That's a quantum jump. That's not one space, however far, maybe Haran is, I don't know, 500 miles, I don't know what the distance is to Yerushalayim. But a real quantum jump is I'm a human being, I have genetic code, I'm, I'm basically, you know, 99%, let's say, similar genetic code to the genetics of a chimp, let's say, right? And suddenly I'm, in, I, I'm praying before God and I can jump up 
and I can feel the presence of God. I'm in his presence and he's aware of me and I'm aware of him being aware of me. That's That's a quantum jump. So this gives you the, the, the power of tefillah. When a person does a proper tefillah, tefillah, in the case of the Sadiqim, would, would lead to Ruach HaKodesh. They would get Ruach HaKodesh in the middle of the tefillah. And that's what happens to Yaakov Avinu, according to the second explanation, that suddenly you come upon the presence of God. Right? That's why you've got Bamako. Okay, let's continue. You see, so you see the sophistication of the Agada. It starts with space, right. but then it goes to Kedusha. Right? And you think, oh, Kedusha, that makes more sense. Actually, it makes less sense. Okay, go ahead. Makom, dual meaning Makom could be Yerushalayim or Kabbalah Baruch The place of the Shekhinah. Okay. The place of the Shekhinah. Bam Makom means that's where the Shekhinah is. So you suddenly feel the presence of the Shekhinah, right? You experience it. Not everybody can experience that, right? Is that true for all the Bama Khoms in the Torah? Like Bama yeah, Bama when you... Har, Bama Khom. Yeah, exactly. When you see Pirashat Re'e, it's over and over and over again. Correct. So that Bama Khom is... That's why there's a Dagesh and the Mem, because it's really Behamma Khom, right? So that's why it's Bama Khom, because it's the place. So the place in the Torah is referring to the, the holy mountain where the Beit HaMikdash is going to be built. And it wasn't revealed yet to, um, to uh, the Jewish people, again, until the days of uh, David HaMelech. Okay, so that's what happened. So, Vayanen Sham Ki Um So now, Yaakov Avinu decides to sleep there, and he has a dream, and in the dream he experiences the presence of God, and, and he discovers that where he's sleeping in the future is going to be the Bet HaMikdash. What does he say when he wakes up? He says, en ze ke im bet Elohim beze He realizes this is, the, this is the house of God, meaning he's sleeping where the Bet HaMikdash is going to be. So in the prophetic vision, he felt like he's in the Bet HaMikdash. And what is the Bet HaMikdash? The Bet HaMikdash is the gate to heaven. That's by Yifkaba Makom. You see, when you go to the Bet HaMikdash, Literally, the gates of heaven are open. And then you stand up there and you pray and you feel you're in the presence of God. That's why, so you understand the idea of Vayif Kaba Makom? I went up to the Harabayit a few times in my life, uh, properly, of course, because you can't go to all the places. And um, there is, um, uh, there's a certain, uh, there's a certain Kedusha there, obviously. Um, I, I don't think I'm surprising anybody when I say that. Uh, you feel a special kedusha. You feel almost something, uh, something very um, awesome. I don't want to say terrifying, but it's 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 something very powerful when you go up to the Harabait. All right, yeah, you just have to go up with the right state of mind, of course, and and to have a sense of humility as you go up there. Um, but nevertheless, is it true that we're not allowed to pray there these days? Um, no so there's the, there is a debate. The debate is more. The debate is more of a political one, meaning, according to halakha, it's permissible to go up to the Harabai. So, so there's three levels of Kedusha. There's Mahane um, Israel, Mahane Leviyah, Mahane Shekhinah. Mahane Israel is the minute you enter the walls of Jerusalem, although today the walls of Jerusalem are not quite where they used to be, but it doesn't matter. Whatever the walls of Jerusalem are, somewhere in the old city, actually, that's called Mahane Israel. Um, Mahane Israel has a certain level of Kedusha. For example, a Mesorah, if a person had left uh, a Salat, whatever Salat is, he wouldn't be allowed to enter. Okay. Second level of Kedusha is called Machane Leviya. Machane Leviya is the wall, uh, the Kotel, is the wall that separates the Machane Israel, which is Jerusalem, from the Machane Leviya. Now, Machane Leviya, you may enter as long as you're not... Um, Baal Keri, Nida, Zav, Zava. So if you make Tevila, proper Tevila, then you may enter the Machane Leviya. You have, you can't wear shoes. Again, you have to have a COVID Rosh. There's no Isur to enter there. That's the truth. But then when you get to the Har Habayit, um, there's different levels, meaning there's different levels of the Kedusha. Um, there is the... Um, the ramp on the right that we see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's Har Habayit. So that ramp goes behind the Kotel. So we can go up there? So, if you made tevilah, right. you're not wearing shoes, no COVID rosh, you're not allowed to carry a package on you or something, you go up there, 
properly, yes, it's permissible. I mean, they have Jews going, religious Jews going up there all the time and, and praying there. Now, what happened is that the now this on Tisha B'Av, because usually when the Jews go up to Arabai, well, okay, let me finish actually the halacha, and then there's Machane Shekhinah. Now, what happened is there's different levels of Kedusha. So once you get to Harabai, there's the um, there's a Hel. That's an extra level of Kedusha. There's a Sorek. But by the time you get there, um, a person who's Tamemet can't enter. So meaning we cannot enter past the, the that area because we're Tamemet. We have Tumat Met. So Tamemet can't enter. But if you stay outside that area, then you're going to, how do you know where that area is? Very simple. Because um, the Gemara says, and the Gemara, the Mishnah, it describes the Harabait and it says you keep going higher to, because it's stairs going higher and as you go more to the middle, higher, and you see the stairs there. So as long as you're not going up the stairs, you know you're staying in the Harabait. There's no problem. Meaning, from a factual um, point of view, you know where the Harabait is. Now what happened is on Tisha B'Av, the... Um, Usually the police don't allow people to pray in the Harab, uh, Jews, Jews are not allowed to pray. I want to be careful. Muslims are not allowed to pray there, obviously. Uh, when I say obviously, I, say, I mean it um, almost in a sense of um, a tragic comedy, but okay. So Muslims pray there, but they don't allow Jews to pray there. On Tisha B'Av, they allow the Jews to pray there. And then they cause a whole firestorm. Why allowing Jews to pray there? I mean, ironically, and now I mean ironically for real, the chief rabbi it went against it. Okay, you know, whatever. They have their they have their cheshbonot. I'm not sure what their cheshbonot are. Probably more political than halachic. Doesn't matter. That's what that was about. There's no issue to pray there. I mean, it's either a suit to go there or not a suit to go there. But there's no issue to pray there, right? The, right? The kind of a, a thing. So uh, when we went there, they let us pray. By the way. Mm-hmm. They, they let us pray. We went there this summer and they, they, they allowed everybody to pray also. But I think to Shabbat, maybe they have cameras there, so people, you know, went out of fit. Were you allowed to bring tefillin? No, no, no. You can't bring your tefillin with you. That forget. That's like not even, you know, like when you go there, if you try to walk, go with tefillin, they got to take them away. You have to keep them at the outside, yeah. Uh, inshallah, one day they'll give us, their, they'll, they, they should build a synagogue there, but that's a different story. Wasn't, there, um, wasn't it that they, at one point, was you can't whisper, you can't pray, you just put them in your mind? Yeah, so originally... They changed? Yeah, they changed, they've changed, this is a positive change. In when we used to go up to Harabait, if they saw you moving your right. lips, you'd get arrested. Right, that's what I remember. Yeah, yeah, you, they, they, they'd arrest you. Yeah. Right, so you had to like, um, like I once went up with a group of Talmidim to Harabait, so what I did is I was explaining to them Pesukim and Tehillim that have to do with prayer. Like I would say, oh, the Pasuk says this and this, and think about this Pasuk. You know, what I, okay, oh, you know, that's what, you, that's what you can do. You don't want to get arrested, you know. So, um, what? Uh, the police, they have the police. The, the Harabait is formally, they have the Jordanian police, the Israeli police, it's under the Waqf, supposedly. Okay, whatever, I don't know, I can't even figure it out. I, I have to read some more Hachmechelem <laughs> stories, some comedies from maybe Mel Brooks, and then I figure out what's happening on Harabait. Um, but anyway, but things are getting better. Things are getting better. Now they, they allow you to pray there. So that's a great thing. Um, okay, <laughs> getting back here. But as I said, the chief rabbi is against that. Okay, God bless them. They're wonderful people. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So if I say he goes to sleep there, he has a dream. After he prayed, um, uh, he, he wanted to go to. Um, what happened is he finished praying. It's still daylight. He wants to return to Haran. So Kiba Hashamish literally means the sun set quickly, right? Meaning it was like a, a rapid sunset. He was thinking, I have time to continue my journey now back northward. No, Kibah Shamish. He had to, um, it became dark. So what happened? God said, So now Yaakov Avinu, what do you think is going through Yaakov Avinu's mind now? So Yaakov Avinu, he essentially is getting kicked out of Israel. Who's staying in Israel? Esav. So what do you think Yaakov Avinu is thinking? Okay, like not good thoughts. He's probably feeling really rotten on the inside. I mean, think of, think of it. You're Yaakov Avinu, you're the son of Ishaq, and you have to leave Israel. Like, you blew it. You blew it. And Esav is staying behind. So you feel terrible. So now Yaakov Avinu is very, like, humbled by this experience. He's like, okay. Right. But God doesn't see it the way Yaakov Avinu sees it. So God understands who Yaakov Avinu is. He knows that Yaakov Avinu is going to be the father of the Jewish people, right? He's going to be Israel one day. 
So he says, this person is the Sadiq, God talking about Yaakov Avinu. Baal Bet Meloni, he is in the place where I place my presence. Yipatel Beloni, nah, I'm not going to let him stay here, stay overnight. What are you leaving suddenly? Miyad Ba Hashemesh, so now the sun set, boom, quickly. Vayano Tukhtiv, and what happened, the same way the sun set quickly so that um, he was forced to stay because it became dark, and that's when he has the dream, and that's when God reveals himself to him, and that's when <coughs> he realizes it's about the Mikdash. But then when he wakes up in the morning, the Pasuk says, the sun rose suddenly. And it says, the sun rose, lo. What does lo mean in Hebrew? Lamid Bab. For him. For him. Lo. Lo. It rose for him. What does it mean, it rose for him? The sun rose for him. The sun rose for the whole world. It wasn't just for him. There's two explanations for this. The standard explanation is the same way the sun set early for him, so as to force him to um, have to stay there overnight and not just leave, because God wanted Yaakov Avinu to feel his presence. When it was time for Yaakov Avinu to leave in the morning, the sun rose early, so Yaakov Avinu can leave early and get back on his uh, on his uh, the road to go to Haran. That's the standard explanation. I think. It means something else. The world is beautiful. <laughs> There's a lot of beautiful things in the world, right? Um, one of my students from Israel, he's in the uh, the Alps now. He just sent me a beautiful picture of the Alps, and he's he's saying how beautiful it is over there. There's a lot of beauty in the world, right? The world is beautiful. And I think what the Gemara is saying is that there's always a Sadiq for whom God shines his beauty. Right? So in, the, in this case, you have Esav is in Israel. The sun didn't rise for Esav, and the sun didn't set for Esav, and the beauty is not there for Esav. Esav is enjoying the beauty because it's a Sadiq like Yaakov, and God is looking at Yaakov. He says, you know, I'm going to bring beauty to the world. And if we all enjoy this beauty, it's Bishut Yaakov Aminu that we can enjoy the beauty. Or today, whoever the Sadiq is or the Sadiqim are. But yeah, in other words, that's what the Pasuk says, Sadiq Yesod Olam. There's a beautiful world. The foundation of the world is because there's always going to be a Sadiq. And Bishut the Sadiq, the world um, has that special radiance, right? You understand the idea? So it's not just for others, yes, because sometimes you go to a place, a lot of the Sha'im. Okay. But there's a Sadiq there. For them, God will bring light. You understand the idea? That's Kiva Hashemesh. For by Yisrachlo Hashemesh, the sun shone for Yaakov. You understand? Shamchat el Yaakov Avinu. It's a beautiful idea. Um, okay, let's continue. Umen uh, alan. So, uh, so now what we said last week, uh, I believe we studied this last week. This is what time is it? Very oh, good. What is, I just want, okay, we're, we're doing an amazing story now. This is from the book of Melachim. I'm going to have to give you the background, but I just want to tell you what we read last week. Um, we read last week how, Abish, I believe we read it. Uh, maybe we accidentally skipped it. I don't know, but I'll tell you. Okay. So Abishai gets to David Amelech. You remember, they're running away from the brother of Goliath. Apparently, the guy was a Wahush also, right? So they're running away from the brother of Goliath. And um, finally, they kill him. Okay, so David, together with Abishai, they kill the brother of uh, Goliath. His name was Yishpi. So they kill Yishpi. Okay. Abishai tells David, uh, King David, what were you doing here? What are you, crazy? <laughs> yeah, entering. It's like a guy drives into Gaza today. What are you, nuts? What are you doing in Gaza? So he says, look, I had the conversation with God. God told me you have a few choices. You have the Avon of Nova Ina Kohanim. What happened in Nova Ina Kohanim was a massacre. You're partially responsible for what happened. And I'm going to punish you. So choose your punishment. Behind door number one is um, I'm going to kill off all your descendants. All your children will be killed. Behind door number two, you will be killed by a... Um, uh, you will be personally killed. You will be captured by your enemy and killed by your enemy. What do you prefer? So David tells God, and this is what David relates to Abishai, I told God, I want to be killed by myself. I don't want, any, I don't want my children to die. 
So he says, you made a mistake. That wasn't the right choice. You have to worry about yourself. What God does to your children, he does to your children. What God does to you, that's your responsibility. So together they made a prayer and they changed the, um, they changed the choice. Okay, that's what happened. That's what happened. Okay. So let me tell you the story because you have to understand the story. Otherwise you're not going to understand the Gemara. Um, hold on, let me go back to where we were. Uh, here. Umenalan de Kalazar et David. So the Gemara says, okay, so when did it happen that the children of David were all killed? Dikhti ba'atalia em ahaziahu ra'ata kimet bena. Atalia, the mother of Ahaziahu, saw that her son was killed. Patako. I'm going, to, I'm going to explain the background in a moment, but I just want to read the pasuk. She gets up and she does something horrendous um, and basically she kills she kills every single descendant of David HaMelech. Okay? Except for one. We'll explain in a moment what happened. So let me give you the background. One of the great stories, one of the great books in the Tanakh is the book of Belachim. It's an amazing book. You remember we used to study it Friday night? Mm-hmm. We After Friday night, after our dinner, we used to go downstairs, I had a bet midrash, and we study every Friday night the book of Melachim. It felt like you felt the, uh, you felt the fire of the Torah. You remember that, Shalomo? Right? Yeah. The book of Melachim was great. Shededa used to be with us, Allah Shalom, it was the best. Anyway, so here's what happened. Ah, remember we studied about Ahav a few months ago. He was one of the kings that has Ophelik Le'olam Abba. So back then, the state of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. It was the northern kingdom. They were really into Abu Dazara. And then there was the kingdom of Jerusalem where they weren't so into Abu Dazara. They were usually good. Later on, they became corrupt. So you have the northern kingdom. And in the northern kingdom, we have Ahav. He's one of the worst kings ever. And Ophelik Le'olam Abba. And his wife was a Phoenician uh, from Lebanon. She was uh, from, uh, she brought the Abu Dazara of the Baal into Eretz Israel. Izevel, her name was Izevel. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said Lebanese. Okay. Lebanese. <laughs> Lebanese. So she brought the Abu Dazara, she was a Goya, obviously, Izevel. She brought the Abu Dazara of the Baal into Eretz Israel. This is in the days of Eliyahu Nabi. Ahab was terrible, a lot of Avonot. Um, Eliyahu Nabi curses him, and finally, there is this king, this guy, he's not a king, he's not a king yet. His name is Yehu. Now this guy is like, this guy, if you ever read the stories of Yehu, he's like a beast. I mean, he's like, he, he really is a beast. The guy was like, he became obsessed with getting rid of Ahav and getting rid of the Abu Dazara and and, 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 and he basically, he not only kills Ahav, he kills every one of Ahav's 70 sons. He has 70 sons, he kills every single one. People become terrified of him. And then he says the following. So it's a revolution. So Yehu kills everyone. So he says the following. He says, look, you think Ahav liked the Baal worship? He was, he was very much into the Baal worship, right? That's nothing. I really love the Baal. That's what I want to do. I want every single priest to the Baal, every single person who believes in the Baal. I want everybody coming. There's a big place of Abu Dazara, Bet Baal. I want everybody coming. And if you don't come and I find out that you're one of the Baal priests, I'm going to kill you. So they're like, oh, we'll come. I mean, okay, like, it's not like, you know, it's like, we're, we're okay with it. So they all come, everybody's there. And he puts guards outside. With swords, he says, if anybody escapes, I'm gonna kill you. This is what he tells the guards. The guy was the guy was like really, he was like a majnoon, he was a beast. He's telling the guards that what every any person who escapes, for every person that escapes, I'm killing one of the guards. So like, the guards are terrified. Basically, every single one of the Nabi Abba were burnt alive, killed, slaughtered completely. And then he takes the place of the Baal, he turns it into a public urinal, or worse than urinal. Okay. So you got the basic picture. This guy Yehu was like, he's obsessed with anybody who had anything to do with Ahav or the Baal. Crazy. He was so against Abu Dazara. And when I say crazy, I mean in a good way. Uh, so what happens? So the daughter of Ahav, before her father was killed, 
we know her father was killed by this guy, Yehu. Ahav was really smart. He wants to have peace with the kingdom of Jerusalem. So his daughter, Atalia, marries the king of Jerusalem. She marries Yotam. All right, so now, they're very nice. They're nice wedding, beautiful. Atalia, she's a rishait, like her father, like her mother. But she's married to the king of Jerusalem, Yotam. And then her son, Ahaziah, he didn't know what's happening in the northern kingdom. He goes to visit Ahav. So Ahaziah, her son, who's now the king, he goes to visit Ahav. Ahav was killed. He was massacred. Now this guy Yehu was like, I told you, he was a little... So um, he, he, he sees Ahaziah and there's a whole entourage of people, the, all the aristocrats from Jerusalem, the whole government, they're going to northern Israel, vacation, resort, spa, whatever. So he sees him, he says, what are you doing here? He says, we're friends with um, Ahav, like we're part of, you know, Ahav's, you know, what do you mean what we're doing here? He kills them all. He kills them all also. <laughs> so he kills all the people of Ahav. He kills uh, Ahaziah. We kill now Atalia, the woman, she was in Jerusalem. She finds out that Yehu killed everybody. And she understands that Yehu is acting on the instructions of Eliyahu and Avi. So she decides she's going to kill every single descendant of David Amela. So she goes on a rampage in Jerusalem. And she starts going one after the other, after the other, after the other, picking off every single person that comes with David. Literally, like the Gemara says, literally, like David Amelech's life was saved, but his children are going to be killed. This is what happened. They were all massacred because of the massacre in Nob. So it's, okay, what happens is a little child, his name is Yoash. He's the descendant of David Amelech. They take him. And the Kohen Gadol puts him in the Kodesh HaKodashim. And nobody enters the Kodesh HaKodashim. Yeah, if a person enters the Kodesh HaKodashim, Hayat Karet, Barminan. The Kohen Gadol, I told you, would enter the Kodesh HaKodashim. If he wasn't, uh, if it wasn't worthy, you know, they used to have like a little chain to pull him out just in case, right? So you enter the Kodesh HaKodashim, just be very careful. I say the same thing about the Beit HaMikdash, Arabayit. It's all, I mean, it's at the same level of Kedusha, but just be very careful if you ever go up to Arabayit. Just make sure you're ready to go up to Arabai. Okay, getting back to this boy, Yoash. He's a little boy, and he's a baby. And he's in the Kodesh Kodashim, and the Kohen Gadol is taking care of him. And this woman, Atalia, doesn't know that this baby is there. She doesn't know it. And he's there for six years. On the seventh year, they finally um, announce, if people thought there was no more descendants of David Melech. They thought it was over. The dynasty is over. The seventh year, they did a counter-revolution. They said, we have a descendant of David HaMelech. And they got Atalia, they executed her, and Yoash became the king. And that's how the Malchut Bet David continued. Okay? So now you know the story. Now that you know the story, we can study the Gemara. That was a kind of background, so you kind of understand what's happening. Do you remember the story, by the way? Do you remember any of this? Uh, yeah. 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 You, yeah? You remember it? Yeah, of course. Shlomo is, is, is wearing the picture as far as being... Oh, Shlomo Melech is like uh, 100, 200 years right. earlier. Oh, earlier. Yeah, yeah, you're meaning these are the descendants of Shlomo. This is after... Yeah. All right, okay, Mechila. Let me, let me give you a little background. his children, so... I mean, what I meant is descendants. His descendants, I should have said. Right? So this is like 100, 200 years after Shlomo Melech. Again, I could be off by, you know, uh, you know here and there. But let's say it's, uh, um, let's say six, seven generations after Shalomo, right? More or less. Again, I didn't do the, the number, but let's say about six, seven generations, or whatever that comes out to. So now you understand. So six generations later, they're all wiped out. Mm-hmm. Everybody's killed. So in northern Israel, they're all massacred. <laughs> Yahoo massacres everybody. In Jerusalem, Atalia kills everybody. Wow. I mean, you thought we had trouble in this country with the, uh, you know, second assassination attempt against Trump. This is trouble. You know, this is trouble, right? This, imagine you live in, the, in these days. We, we live in, you know, I, I'm not saying we don't live in exciting days and, you know, there's not stuff happening. And, um, <laughs> but this is pretty nasty as well, okay? Let's put it that way. All right, so now let's read it. Um, and, and what time is it? No, no, fine? Yep. Okay. Umen alan de kalazar edadin. When did it happen? that the descendants of David Melech were killed. Because we said that David Melech and Abishai made a prayer, and they said, we want to switch the choice. We don't want David Melech to be killed. We want his descendants to be killed. 
Atalian and Mahaziao. Atalian, the mom of Mahaziao. Now, Mahaziao was a guy, Hazid. He just wanted to go to northern Israel, see his, uh, you know, see, see Ahab. I mean, you know, he was, he, he, he figured it's his uh, relative, right? Uh, and, and he got killed by Yehu. So, Atalian, the mom, she, she found out that her son was killed by Yehu. She killed everybody. All the descendants of David Amelech killed. The Gemara says, you said the deal was that God is going to kill all the descendants of David HaMelech. But that's not what happened. Yoash, that little boy, he was a baby. They took him, they smuggled him, they put him in the Kodesh Kodashim, And after seven years, they took him out. On the seventh year, they took him out. And he became king. Because in Novi Kohanim, everybody was massacred. But there was one young Kohen called Eviatab. And he was able to run away while they were killing all the other Kohanim. He runs away and he joins David HaMelech. So the same way that one of the Kohanim of Novi and Kohanim was saved, one of the descendants of David HaMelech was saved. So whenever Hashem does, um, does something, it's very precise. It's not just, there's nothing haphazard happening. All these things are done with tremendous precision. Tehtim, as the Pasuk says, one of the descent, one of the children of Achimelech, Achimelech was a Kohen Gadol, he escapes, um, and his name was Eviatar, and he escaped. And that's what Abu Dhan, the name of Rabban, said. If it wasn't for the fact that one person survived, from Nov Ira Kohanim, nobody was, would have survived from the descendants of David HaMelech. But because somebody survived, that one person, then Yoash, the descendant of David, ended up surviving. Um, okay. David is getting blamed for Nov. He was to blame in the sense that, look, um, you can't, when you have a dictator, okay, this guy's a crazy guy. Let's say Shaul had a certain madness to him. Hazit, whatever. I, you know, I love Shaul, and, and, and I think many of Chachamim will tell you that they love Shaul. So I love Shaul, but he had a certain craziness. Some, some ruach ra'a got into him, and he wanted to kill David HaMelech. Now it's a dictatorship. Now you go into the city of Nov Ila Kohanim, they give you food, they give you the sword of Goliath, they take care of you. What do you think is going to happen? Now you're David HaMelech. Now you should know what's going to happen. You're endangering the lives of all these people. You can't just go to Novi Rakwanim and expect that nothing is going to happen. And it did. It happened. So he is kind of response, meaning, you know, he didn't do it. He didn't want it to happen. But you have to take responsibility. When the nation, when you're a king, when you're a leader, and you bring about a disaster, you have to take responsibility. You can't ignore it. That, that's what that's what this story is about. It's kind of extreme that all the descendants yeah. of one gets corrected. God, it's it's you know it's one of the crazy things. But the pasuk says, "El emuna ve'en avel sadik ve'asharu." And the pasuk says, "Asul tamim pa'olo ki chol delacham mishpat." God's actions are very precise. Now, when you do something wrong in your life, or when I do something wrong in my life, I can make teshuva because that's me. That's I'm an individual. If you're the leader of a nation, and now you cause the nation to have made an avon, you cause the nation to have undergone a catastrophe, that's different. You can't just say, oh, I, I, I regret it. Okay, it's good that you regret it, and God will forgive you for regretting it's it. Too hard to fix. But there's, what? It's too hard to fix. It's too hard to fix. I'll, I'll give you an example, October 7th. Okay, I realize we shouldn't have left Gaza in 2005. It was a mistake. But okay, like, like, good for you that you realize it was, it was a mistake. But what are you like? What are you talking about? By the way, they just—I uh, don't know if you saw—they interviewed me on a podcast, Judaism Demystified. I recommend you take a look at it. It was like a one and a half hour podcast where we were discussing what's happening in Israel, uh, October seventh, and that's one of the things I discussed there. Um, was that specific point? So um, okay, I think we're good here. I think we're uh, yeah. Don't mean to say, okay, I don't know what my name is three and four generations, but this is six, seven, eight generations. Yeah, but that's for an individual Avera. This is a national catastrophe. The massacre of Novi Rakoni was a national catastrophe. It really was. I mean, it was horrible. Imagine, God forbid, that we should ever see anything like that—that that a city of Kohanim is massacred. 
You know, and like David HaMelech went there, and I understand David, I don't blame David, but it's like, come on, what are you doing? They're all gonna die because of you, don't you get it? The guy, is your, your, your father in law is gonna kill them all, and that's what happened. So he has to take some respect, that, that's the responsibility. What was his, uh, how, how did he get blamed for that? Uh, because what happened is that David uh, Shaul had a spy, Doeg Edomi was there, and he saw them, the Kohanim, giving David Amelech food, giving him the sword of Goliath, mm-hmm. and then he goes back to Shaul, like all dictators, how do dictators work? They have spies, mm-hmm. and basically Shaul finds out, and he goes to Novi like Kohanim, and he massacres all the Kohanim. Why did you help David? And they didn't even know. They didn't know that there was an issue. Like, yeah, they were just helping David Amelech. You know, they thought David, you know, we're going to help him. So how is that David's fault? That Shaul did that thing. He shouldn't have endangered the lives of these Kohanim. He should have found another solution to his problems. He shouldn't have gone there for food. But again, I'm not blaming, not blaming David. I'm describing the dilemma. You know, people always as people always look for good solutions in life. Sometimes there's no good solution. Sometimes, like you got these situations. David's fault. You can't blame him. I can't. I'm not blaming him. What is the I'm not. You but he the, shouldn't have gone there for food. But that was a city of refuge. God blame him. <sighs> not blaming, but the fact is, his life. He saved his life. At the expense of all these people who got massacred. Yeah, but then, then he saves his own life at the at the expense of his descendants. What is that? That's right. Not, I mean, well, I mean, that's not a, so so. That's well, I think I think the idea there is that you worry about doing what's good for yourself. One should, um, and in fact, that's an interesting question. Let me let me address it maybe next week. That's an interesting question. Him versus his descendants. I like that question. Building we'll up the next year. I want to give it some thought. Should we say Kaddish? I guess. Yeah, yeah. Just one other. Yes. Like I'm not addressing this in this context, or it's yeah, more, it's personal regarding Kolomed, uh, David, Hote, you know. Oh, no, no, that's a different one. That's a Gemara, that's a good get to vote. Davzain, we're talking about, no, not the, uh, earlier than that. We're talking about Batsheva. That's a Avera Batsheva, not this. And that was an individual yeah. sin. So it's a, right? That was a little different, right? Kolomed, David, Chata, Eno, Ela, Toe. Right? And that's a different. Do you understand that? Then? We are mistaken? Right, right. I mean, if you think that David the Melech made an Avera with Batsheva and El Atoe, because David the Melech used to give the, I mean, the, they used to give the Chayalim, they used to give their wives Gitin, and but whatever that Gemara says, but that's a different issue. So it's personal. Yes, the Rabbi Hananya? Yeah, of course. Rabbi Hananya, Merakashia, Merasaka,